Uh, so today we'll talk a little bit about privacy. Um, mechanic, that was a fantastic talk before. Um, and what I think is so cool about conference like this is people uh, and everyone can come up and talk about you know their opinions on things and what they think. You know, you might agree with some things I'm saying, you might disagree. Uh, I felt that way about so many of these talks, but it's so cool to get all of us together to come and uh, share and explore different ideas. So let's dive in here. Um, I care a lot about uh, these issues. I think if you're here right now before Bitcoin has gone on its parabolic bull run, you're obviously a little bit uh, ideological and you care about these issues. So I'm the CEO of a co company called Consensus Protocol, um, and we recently just launched our Cypherpunk podcast um, to kind of talk about a lot of these ideas. And um, my first, I'm doing a series with uh, the chief editor of Bitcoin Magazine, Aaron Van Weirdum. Um, he's the author of the Genesis book, so stay tuned for that. First couple episodes have been released. Um, so I've been around for a little while in the space, almost probably about a decade now. <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit about the intersection of privacy, technology, and freedom. So why does it matter to uh, us as miners and custodians of these decentralized networks? What is privacy in the digital age? Uh, privacy is the right to keep personal data secure and shielded from surveillance, um, especially if you're uh, an American. Uh, we have the Constitution. We have certain rights that were uh, given to us that governments are not allowed to intrude on. Um, but we see that every day that uh, that is not exactly the case, right? So um, from, physical, from physical privacy to, uh, to digital footprints, so old privacy, um, you know, physical mail, your, your house, uh, your family, et cetera, new privacy. A lot of stuff's happening on the internet as the internet's evolved. There's uh, way more intrusive ways to be monitored. Um, and these cypherpunks are a group of people that saw this coming years in advance when the, the uh, roots and the, the all the technical aspects of the internet were being laid and kind of said, hey, there, you know, there's a huge potential problem here for massive abuse. Uh, so why is privacy critical? Um, it's a fundamental human right. Uh, obviously, there's UN resolutions about this. Um, for Americans, right, we've got the Fourth Amendment. Uh, so what are the implications of this, of privacy loss? How does government surveillance and, you know, uh, how does that influence people's behavior when you're being surveilled? So surveillance empowers conformity. Um, and conformity, you know, we see this in certain uh, different countries where um, everybody knows they're kind of being watched, right? People behave and act differently. Um, everybody tries to conform to that. I um, mean, we're starting to feel that even in America today, right? It's like, when, should I send this text message? Do I know, you know, is this going to come back on me? Can I say this? Can I do this, right? Um, it's kind of scary in a lot of ways. So people under surveillance are more likely to conform to social norms, avoid controversial uh, topics. We've seen this in media, on social media. You know, can, can I really say that? Am, is, is it okay? Am I allowed to, to speak my mind, speak my opinion? Um, they engage in self-censorship, uh, self -censorship, particularly in environments where dissenting opinions might be judged or penalized. Uh, this phenomenon has been observed in journalists, activists, ordinary indiv individuals. This is known as the chilling effect. So there's research being conducted, a lot of research being conducted on that, how it affects people um, and how people behave differently. Um, Self-censorship, reluctance to associate, erosion of trust. People carefully moderate their speech. Uh, this is common in places like Russia. Um, I have friends there that, you know, it's, they use coded language or parables to uh, discuss certain things and there's expressions and um, especially with countries that have a uh, long history of this type of censorship. Uh, suspicion, paranoia, you know, seen a lot of this. Brighter, uh, broader societal impacts. People leave a lot of these countries, right? They flee um, if, you know, they can't speak their mind. Uh, you know, if you're a totalitarian or authoritarian, all that sounds like a dream come true. <laughs> In the European Court of Human Rights, for example, reference is frequently made to the danger that secret surveillance measures may undermine or even destroy democracy under the cloak of defending it. So this was some recent uh, research that came out. This kind of behavior, censorship, and the violation of privacy uh, hinder societal progress. Um, it is often those who challenge authority, like you know, here in America, you know, people that form great ideas and help advance technology and society. Um, they're often people who reject authority or buck the trend or refuse social conformity on a lot of issues. 
Uh, our constitutional rights are at the heart of what it means to be an American, um, embodying the freedom to pursue happiness and be rewarded for our efforts. These liberties have driven unparalleled innovation, fueling breakthroughs in industry, science, and technology, and fostering an environment where progress thrives. Um, there's been a lot of attacks on uh, privacy. You know, the, ra the road to hell is often paved with, uh, with good intentions, right? It's for your safety, um, it's for, you know, better uh, behavior of everybody, all of these, you know, fallacious arguments we hear. Social credit systems, you know, happening in uh, places like China, you know, tracking people's behavior, uh, everything they do, whether it be cameras, uh, monitoring if you cross the street when you're not supposed to, right, to uh, all sorts of crazy things, monitoring where you're spending your money, all, all of these little things that uh, really create this chilling effect on behavior. Um, so, you know, again, people behave and act differently when they are being surveilled and they realize they're being surveilled. It's, it's a scary future, um, and you know, the cypherpunks are a group of people who saw the groundwork of this, um, of how this could evolve and how this could play out over time, and how this could be you know, terrible for humanity in a lot of ways, right? It always starts with good intentions, but it's very easy for uh, this power, the power of being able to do all this to spiral out of control. So they give you a score, you know, do you conform to society? You know, how, uh, do you have certain political viewpoints? Uh, do you argue, um, you know, what, what have you done? All of these things, um, they can, you can be blackballed, blacklisted. The absence of privacy enables authoritarian control where individuals can be punished for personal choices, often without due process. Um, even here in America, right, there's this program called PRISM, a uh, clandestine surveillance program launched by the U.S. National, the NSA, um, that enables the U.S. government to collect and monitor internet communications from major tech companies like Google, Apple, Facebook, Microsoft, and others uh, under the authority of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. Um, we know because of people like Edward Snowden that, you know, they're just collecting data on everybody, like, you know, every, every individual, every person in society. Tons of data, tons of information, without, uh, in violation of the Fourth Amendment, without going to a court with reasonable suspicion to get that information, right? Uh, Julian Assange, through his organization WikiLeaks, exposed numerous incidents of uh, government corruption, overreach, etc. And even today we see, you know, First Amendment violations, the government working with uh, big tech companies to put pressure and coercion on different individuals, different platforms, uh, you know, working in tandem, hand in hand with these, uh, and it's almost a giant technocracy, uh, working hand in hand to, you know, attack and violate your rights, your freedom of speech, uh, and your constitutional rights. The state of privacy today, uh, even last week, you know, uh, Telegram CEO, he was arrested in France, uh, Pavel Durov, right, and he's always been very adamant about, you know, privacy and not exposing all of this data to governments and other people. And, Despite that fact, they still collect all that data, right? So um, he may have an intention, but he's a central point of failure. Um, and as we've seen, you know, after his arrest, after his, they, they essentially put a gun to his head, <laughs> uh, you know, Telegram updated his terms of service, signaling compliance with law enforcement by agreeing to share user phone numbers, IP addresses, and all sorts of data, right? So um, what was once a, a tool of more secure uh, communication, albeit not perfect, um, even though he had that intention, he was a central he was a, a central attack vector uh, for the blob or different intelligence agencies or the police state to essentially come after him, right? So obviously this was inevitable. You know, same thing with Elon and, and Twitter. Um, we may like or we may agree or disagree, et cetera, about how Twitter is being run now. Um, but, and Elon has put his thumb on the scales because it's his organization. But if he, he is still a central point of attack. Here's just some people's takes on the setup here, uh, we need a Satoshi for messaging, I like that, I thought that was a cool one. <clears throat> um, and it's an alarming trend in, especially American media, uh, to see, you know, different things like this. Uh, pieces in the New York Times, right, the Constitution is dangerous, the Constitution is sacred, is it also dangerous, right? Laying the groundwork for um, an attack on the very core foundation of the American experiment. Um, oh, didn't mean to scare you guys. Um, Hillary Clinton said in a recent uh, MSNBC interview that the federal government <laughs> should prosecute Americans who spread propaganda. Uh, what exactly defines propaganda? Who gets to decide that, right? These are the questions we have to ask ourselves as a society. Research indicates an increase in internet censorship even in countries traditionally seen as bastions of free speech. 
This includes unexpected places like the US, UK, Norway, Ireland, and Japan, suggesting a global trend towards more restrictive internet policies. Members of Congress are exploring ways to rein in the media environment, stating that censorship is necessary to prevent the spread of disinformation. I don't know if this speech will play, but I guess not. Um, who gave them the authority to decide what's true or false? Right? Who gets to decide what's true? Uh, it's clear they're setting their sights on you know, platforms like X. We just saw what happened uh, to Telegram. Disinformation is code word for censorship and control. Um, there's, there's a famous Carl Sagan quote that I like that goes something like, you know, the best cure for a fallacious argument or bad information is active and rigorous debate and counter arguments, counter uh, you know, engagement, right? Instead of censoring <laughs> those opinions, right? Because or those those uh, alternative facts, as they like to call them, the, that disinformation, right? Because those people don't go away; they just go somewhere else. They go underground, and you can't have an engagement uh, of ideas. I think uh, X is doing a really good job with this, with this idea of community notes, letting multiple people weigh in, gathering all opinions. You, you know, you've got the original post, you've got all sorts of comments underneath, um, and then you, you sort of have this I, this this period of engagement where people can engage with different ideas, present different uh, facts, different thoughts, um, and I think it's, it's largely working well. Here's another one. America has a free speech problem from the New York Times. The First Amendment is out of control. Why America needs a hate speech law? <clears throat> so here, you know, there's been some rejection of this uh, agenda from the judicial system, right? The Amer America, the founders thought through a lot of these things, they thought about a lot of these ideas, and they created three separate branches of government to uh, fight back against Orwellian or uh, over control by one, one part of the government, right? When they've exceeded their mandate, there's this, this idea of a check on power. So, you know, a judge, we have you know, court cases, active court cases going right now where, you know, people are pushing back on this. A judge limited the Biden administration's officials from contacting social media sites, uh, a ruling that could curtail, uh, and here they're posting this in a negative light, the New York Times, a ruling that could curtail, curtail efforts to fight disinformation. Um, you know, <laughs> it's kind of funny. You know, our, the First Amendment, the way they're trying to go around the First Amendment where they can't, you know, censor or stop you from speech. They're putting pressure on companies to do this. Um, if, you've, if you've been in crypto for a long time, we're seeing a very similar thing happen with Choke Point 2.0 where they're trying to cut off our industry from making access, um, shut down our bank accounts because they can't do it. They, there's no law that says crypto companies or Bitcoin companies, et cetera, can't have access to the bank account. So they're doing it the roundabout way and putting pressure on the banks themselves and sly threats behind the scenes. How Brazil's experiment fighting fake news led to a ban on X. So we're seeing this now. Um, they gave this judge a lot of power. I'm sure you guys have seen this in the, in the news cycle. Um, the, you know, there, there's a lot of, a lot of platforms we use are, are very centralized uh, when it comes to information. Luckily, uh, we have something like Bitcoin when it comes to money, right? But for information, we don't necessarily have something that has caught on yet and really uh, taken off, right? We've got Noster and some of these other ideas, uh, Warpcast, et cetera. Uh, the Australian censorship commissar is, is demanding global content bans, right? So certain countries are saying that, telling companies that they can't post things at other places that we're, uh, people all over the world can't see. Uh, this is just kind of insane. You know, uh, government censorship on TikTok, different platforms. You know, you look at, you see a lot of Western uh, companies, which you wouldn't expect, are the chief proponents of this censorship. Uh, censorship. Australia, New Zealand, Israel, the UK, Germany, et cetera, right? Uh, lead the list. Uh, here are the countries where you know X is banned. This was after Brazil uh, banned, formerly blocked. <clears throat> Australia plans to find social media companies over misinformation. Uh, they want to force social media companies to censor public health information or face a five percent fine of their global revenue. This means that anyone that questions the you know official COVID lockdown narratives or et cetera uh, in a public crisis, you know, we can't have debate, we can't have discussion. They don't want you to be able to make your own decision about what you want to do with your own body, uh, how you you know control your freedom of movement, all of these different things, right? Uh, very Orwellian. Quick global uh, overview of different acts, different things, different uh, efforts by governments to 
criminalize and shut down the use of different things, right? Even VPNs. Uh, we saw this in the late 90s and uh, early 90s. You know, fight a fight against cryptography, a fight against encryption by the government. They want to have back doors into these things. They want to have, uh, you know, the ability to attack your privacy. And, you know, without warrants, without following the Constitution. The EU, we've got stuff like uh, the Network Enforcement Law, Digital Services Act, uh, and then, you know, again, they want to allow vetted researchers that can access platform data, raising concerns about NGO influence on content censorship. We're seeing a lot of this now, stuff that governments can't do. They use uh, NGOs, which are non-government organizations that they give them a bunch of money to do a certain thing that they technically can't do. That's uh, one of my favorite things that's happening. Uh, so NGOs and government-backed initiatives support the law, which face opposition for its potential to create a thought crime. Fact-checked. You're getting fact-checked. Brazil, Bill 2630, targets the spread of fake news on social platforms with severe penalties for noncompliance. We've seen a lot of this, a lot of action stuff happening in Brazil lately. Uh, Canada, you know, th the common thread here is these are a lot of Western nations that are really going after uh, the ability for people to communicate, talk, spread different ideas, thoughts. Um, you know, how is this affecting us right now? None of these videos will probably work, but you know, there's different foundations, the uh, Tech Watch Org, you know, watching, sur actually counter surveilling the people that are surveilling us. Some very interesting research happening. Uh, Bitcoin, <clears throat> so what is Bitcoin's role in all this? The role of Bitcoin in blockchain technology and privacy. Um, so Bitcoin offers pseudonymity, right? Anybody can join the network, generate a wallet totally permissionlessly. Um, <clears throat> which is amazing. Anybody in the world can use this monetary network. They don't have to go through a bank. They don't have to have it, you know, any, anything at all. Just, just a uh, you know, smart device, which even the poorest people in the world have. Bitcoin offers a fully transparent network with pseudonymous privacy for individuals. Transactions are recorded on a public ledger, but linked only to wallet addresses, not personal identities. There's still a lot happening on the privacy front when it comes to Bitcoin, and hopefully we'll continue to see more stuff. Um, I, I know with each, I'm not super technical myself, but with each rollout of, of different technologies like SegWit, um, you know, privacy improves, and there's different options, uh, different ways to use Bitcoin, have different types of Bitcoin wallets. Uh, why does this matter? So financial censorship in action, uh, if anybody was paying attention, you heard about this convoy of truckers in Canada and the whole protest situation. The government just essentially arbitrarily decided that these people were terrorists, <laughs> so they didn't have to follow the regular course of law, right? Like, you know, you think if a trucker is blocking the street and cars can't get through, you know, there's a law, there are laws in place for that, right? You, you have the police come, they tow the vehicle, you have to go to court, et cetera, you're doing this, you know, there's a system to deal with those types of civil, acts of civil disobedience, right? We have it, there's already laws on the books for those types of things, right? But instead of using those laws, you know, that were already, that the, uh, that were already in place, the government decided that, no, 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 we're just going to, we're gonna call these people terrorists, <laughs> and then we are gonna just totally take away all their rights, close their bank accounts, um, and just do something straight out of a George Orwell novel, um, which, which actually happened. Um, so during this uh, event that occurred, you know, we, we actually got to test out, you know, the use of a monetary network like Bitcoin. <clears throat> and uh, it worked very well, right? This is this idea of anti-fragility and uh, this anti-fragile system. And many of these truckers were able to get funding and people that wanted to donate uh, when they got shut off from crowdfunding uh, platforms like GoFundMe, um, you know, Bitcoiners were able to send Bitcoin and they were able to use that to finance their operations and do different things. Challenges to privacy in the Bitcoin ecosystem. Blockchain analysis, I mean, it's, it has its pros, it has its cons, right? But for, um, if you're going after a serious you know, criminal, you know, there's a lot of uh, ability to really do that. Well, at the same time, leave you know, the, the mom or person alone, that's just making a small transaction. Um, and, Mining centralization is another thing that, that's been discussed a lot today. There's been some great uh, talks and conversations about that. Regulatory pressure from uh, different, uh, you know, actors, uh, you know, lawsuits, laws, all sorts of things. Um, and I do agree that does help make the network more anti-fragile, but uh, it also, you know, I'm going to take the counter argument to what Mechanics said. I think we should be embracing and supporting these protocols and these, these systems in America because there's nothing more American about it, uh, about Bitcoin. It's one of the most American ideas possible, right? Um, it just falls neatly in line with the Constitution and the founding of this nation. 
And you know, that's great for the whole world too. How can we help as custodians of decentralized networks like Bitcoin and other blockchains? Mining decentralization um, you know, is, a, is a key to this. It's a key to privacy. Mining and free speech. Power of proof of work. So there's, all, there's different systems that are being tested. Proof of work, obviously we're all here at a mining conference, so we feel strongly about proof of work. Um, but there's also you know, proof of stake. There's other systems that are being tested. Uh, we think pr proof of work is, uh, I personally believe it's superior. Uh, proof of work ensures that anyone can contribute computing power, preventing central entities from controlling or censoring transactions. Proof of work strengthens privacy by allowing miners to remain pseudonymous, distributing the power to validate transactions globally. Um, you know, 51% attacks are very hard and very expensive to do, so there's that extra level of security. Um, you know, unlike proof of stake, which I think is the, is the most attractive aspect of proof of work and mining is the fact that, um, you know, just because you own a bunch of the asset doesn't give you all of the control, right? You still, you know, you still have to provide the physical infrastructure, the security, make that electricity trade off day in and day out and you know, monitor and run your operations where with proof of stake, it's just you, know, you own a bunch of the whatever coin is and you get to have much more influence, much more control there. Well, it's kind of how the status quo system of the world already works. Uh, proof of work isn't perfect, but it's the best system that we've got. As miners and custodians of these decentralized networks, we still have work to do. Um, we just kind of talked about that a little bit. Decentralized mining is key to ensuring the survival of privacy and freedom preserving technologies, right? So um, we want to avoid centralization, whether it's with mining pools um, or whether with its huge uh, giant companies, right, that are attack surfaces for the network, right? Because if the government does come to a marathon or whoever, you know, they, they, are, they are, if marathon is, is creating the block and doing all of that process, you know, that's an outsized control that they have, right? So this idea of decentralized mining is, is very important and, you know, uh, Mark and Ocean are, are doing a lot to help there. Um, so other networks like Ethereum, we can look at the centralization of these entities, right? You've got three or four entities that essentially have 70% of the state's Ethereum, right? Um, little disturbing. In the fight for privacy and free speech, miners play a critical role in supporting decentralized open source protocols. Um, you know, we want to continue to be good custodians of these networks. I think what uh, Mechanic was talking about in his last speech. Um, as participants in decentralized ecosystems, we must prioritize the values of decentralization and resist short-term gains from centralization, right? So um, as miners, you know, we have a part to play here. We have a role. Um, the decisions we make are important. They have implications. Um, proof of work's inherent nature guards against centralization more effectively than proof of stake, but both systems require vigilant stewardship to remain true to their decentralized ethos. So I think it's, I personally think it's great to have all and test all these different types of systems. Uh, you know, let's test proof of work, let's test proof of stake, let's have these different uh, free market ideas. You know, let's engage, let's see what happens, right? Let's have more than one system in case one system is attacked. The future of privacy and free expression depends on small miners who support these alternative networks. So if many of you are here today and you've got, you know, five miners in your garage, you know, you really are super important to the network and, um, you know, that's how many of us started. I mean, I started with a couple miners in a room, right? So, you know, you got to start somewhere. Uh, Bryant earlier was talking about that, right? You start small and you test it out uh, and you learn about it, right? But, you know, these, Peter had the idea of having tons of different businesses running a couple miners, right? That's awesome. I hope that's the case. There's other privacy preserving technologies, uh, ZK proofs, uh, homomorphic encryption, secure multi-party computation, um, you know, real world applications of mining and blockchain. This is still an active field. You know, many things are being deployed, evolving. Um, there's a lot of research going into these things. Bitcoin coin joins, right? We've seen the attack recently on some wallets doing this. Pay join. Privacy wallets, again, I think it was, uh, it was either Wasabi or Samurai that got attacked. So here it is, Samurai, um, you know, we have to fight back against these things. We have to decentralize this infrastructure uh, to prevent governments from having an attack surface to come after. You know, there's no reason that, uh, you know, someone who goes to the grocery store should not be able to use one of these, you know, CoinJoin wallets to obfuscate 
you know, how much wealth they have from the grocer or whoever they're buying something from, right? You know, like, I, when I go to, if I go to, if I go to uh, El Salvador and go to Publix or whatever, uh, you know, merchant or store they have there and I want to buy a bunch of food, you know, I don't necessarily want that vendor to know how much Bitcoin I have. That's a security risk. Like, I don't want them to know how much Bitcoin I have in my wallet. So, of course, I'm going to want to use a tool like this, right? I don't want, you know, when I transact or buy something or do something, you don't want them being able to trace back and look how, how much money is in your wallet or how much, uh, you know, Bitcoin you have. It's common sense. So here's a uh, the response here. Um, developers launched an uh, Ashigaru, a fork of the Samurai wallet, which contain, uh, continues to provide privacy tools while focusing on decentralization. So I think that's important. We've seen this in, in many eras, whether it uh, was Napster, was a centralized company, um, and now we've got BitTorrent, I believe, which is a more decentralized version of that for file sharing, et cetera. So uh, shout out to Ocean, what they're doing. Um, you know, huge deal. Um, th what, what, they're, what they're implementing here to give individual control, which is you know, super important for mining pool centralization um, and decentralization. Um, right now, if you, we still have issues, right? Like, you know, even though Bitcoin is decentralized, even though we think it's the best protocol, um, there are still these issues, right? So uh, Mechanic talked about, a lot about that. There's, you know, a few large mining pools that control a huge portion of the network. Um, and, the, you know, as was mentioned, the centralization allows the pools to ultimately decide uh, what to censor, what to put in a transaction, which, you know, it's a huge, it's a huge uh, attack surface to be under the, uh, have the ability to have that regulatory pressure enforced on you, right? Well, if you're mining with two miners in your garage, that's not going to happen to you. But if you're Marathon, you know, that is a huge risk. It's a huge, it's a huge problem that could crop up, right? It, it doesn't matter until it actually matters. Um, KYC, this is another thing I've seen a lot. Um, you know, we got to reject that. Um, the fact that, my, that mining pools should have to KYC is, uh, in my opinion, ridiculous. So here's the non-custodial payment system that Ocean talks a lot about. Um, opaque block template construction, transparent block templates, Stratum v2, you know, Stratum v2 is this idea, this mining protocol using encryption to enhance privacy and security in mining pools. Um, other networks doing different things, right? We talked about, you know, is, is Bitcoin the place to store JPEGs? Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of debate topic, but there's other networks that may be made for the specific of storing files, for example, with Filecoin decentralized file storage um, using ZK technology, Oasis, um, Secret. There's all sorts of different networks doing different things. Incognito, a privacy blockchain allows for private versions. Supporting open source protocols. So things like Lightning Network, Noster, uh, important, right? How else can we be a part of the resistance? So here's another political advocacy group. Um, find out where politicians stand on crypto. Um, you know, there's been certain problems with them, um, but you know, it's a it's a nice start to to have a place to advocate for. You know, again, I'm, I take the other side of a lot of this issue. I think we want jobs, opportunities uh, to be here in the U.S. as opposed to other places. It's great that they're in other places too, um, but we should be embracing this much like we did with the internet companies, and uh, we want all that a lot of that innovation here. We want them, of course, to be objective with their you know, standards to evaluate political campaigns. So recently, we've started the Cypherpunk podcast. You know, uh, our mission is a podcast dedicated to exploring the intersection of privacy, technology, and freedom. So we've got a lot of great uh, guest speakers, a lot of uh, episodes pre-recorded. Um, <clears throat> Bob from Bob and Mark also uh, from Ocean on the Pod. They're going to be released in the next coming weeks. If you're interested in uh, learning more, join our community. Feel free to scan the code um, to follow the podcast, et cetera. Let's see here. Privacy is necessary for an open society in the electronic age, which is Eric Hughes, who's an OG cypherpunk. Together we can build a more private, secure, and free digital world. Thank you guys for listening. <laughs>